rise. Court of Appeals Division 1 is now in session. Please be seated. Thank you very much. Again, let me apologize for running over with the last argument. We appreciate your patience today, so thank you. This is um, oral, uh, oral argument in N. Ray Stevens versus um, Johannes. Thank you very much. Our cause number CV 130395. Let's begin with introductions of counsel. Don Barnes on behalf of the appellant, Jonas Johannes. Thank you very much, sir. Taylor Young of Mandel Young on behalf of Captain Stevens. Thank you very much. I know that your experience, counsel, here, uh, let me just, and so you know the our, um, uh, uh, rules that we go by, but let me just make sure we're all on the same page. Each side has 20 minutes. Um, the appellant may reserve time for rebuttal. When you go to the lectern, if you would like to do so and let us know, we'll try and make sure that you end up with that rebuttal time. We have reviewed closely the briefing on appeal. We have reviewed pertinent portions of the record, so we're familiar with the issues and the basic facts in the, uh, the case. We are uh, recording the, uh, the proceeding today, both audio and video. So when you go to the lectern, if you would please restate your name. That way, if we have any members of the public who are listening to this, they'll know who is speaking. Um, I think that's, uh, I think I've covered all the preliminaries, so let's go ahead and begin. May it please the court, my name is John Barnes. I'm here on behalf of the appellant, Mr. Jonas Johannes, who I will refer to as the father in this case. I'd like to reserve three to five minutes for rebuttal. Um, there are three categories of reasons for reversing the modification order in this case. First and foremost is that the court failed to make any of the findings on the record that are required by law. For example, the court failed to make its own findings in reference to the child's best interests. Instead, the court merely incorporated by reference the uh, findings listed in Dr. Shawley's custody evaluation report. By failing to make its own findings, the court abused its discretion, which requires reversal. It's also worth no noting, however, that Dr. Shawley's report also failed to make the requisite findings. Nowhere in the report did Dr. Shawley identify a change in circumstances that has occurred since the original decree, uh, nor did he uh, explain the question or answer the question why his findings uh, serve the best interests of the child in, in modifying. Thus, the report and the order uh, both failed to uh, address the requisite findings. Um, the second point I want to talk about is it goes to Dr. Shawley's improper and unauthorized diagnosis of father as having narcissistic personality disorder, which is uh, characterized as a serious personality disorder by uh, Dr. Shawley. Uh, the family court abused its discretion in relying on this diagnosis for several reasons. First, it violated father's rights under Rule 63 of the family court rules. Father didn't have notice that he had come under scrutiny for a serious personality disorder, and because he didn't have notice, he also was unable to exercise any of the other safeguards provided under the rule, uh, such as having a, uh, a representative present during um, any assessment. Another reason to reject the diagnosis is that uh, Dr. Shawley was not authorized to make this diagnosis in the first place. Counsel, the, let me ask, uh, father stipulated the evaluation, correct? That's right. Um, father stipulated to the custody evaluation and the court entered an order appointing uh, Dr. Shawley as the, the custody evaluator. Mm -hmm. That order did not give Dr. Shawley carte blanche to, to bypass the rules or uh, make his own uh, diagnoses. So it's this it's exceeding the scope of the court's order, is that your argument? That, that's right. Um, if you look at the order, it says that uh, Dr. Shawley may request certain adjunct services, including psychological assessment. Um, there's no, no record of any request uh, to a full psychological assessment of the father. Let me ask you, though, you raised this issue with the very court that issued the order that authorized the evaluation, and that court did not agree with your position. Is that correct? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Sure. Um, if, if the question is, did this exceed the, the scope of the trial court's order for the evaluation, mm -hmm. um, and I think you've told me it, that's the issue, right. um, or told us that, um, you raised this issue with that very judge who issued the order, and he disagreed with you. Well, um, in the, the pretrial hearing statement, um, Father, I'll give you the exact language, Father says, 
uh, Dr. Shali inappropriately diagnosed father within the context of the custody eval evaluation, uh, and then relies almost entirely on this diagnosis while admittedly disregarding all of the data. That's from index of record number 138. So yes, the father did tell the trial court or the family court that uh, yes, this, this was inappropriate in the context of a custody evaluation. In other words, it exceeded the scope of the court's prior order. Exactly. But that court said, no, it didn't effectively. Is that it? Precisely. Okay. Let me make sure I understand. In, in the uh, family court, did father specifically argue that the diagnosis violated Rule 63A? Father didn't, he didn't specifically reference uh, Rule 63, um, but he, based on the language I just cited, certainly raised the issue that this was uh, improper, uh, the, the way this whole thing went about. Um, and if that's not enough, I would argue that this is a matter of a fundamental error because... Well, that may well be true, but people waive constitutional rights all the time. That's a well-established principle if it's not preserved for the trial court to address. Fair enough, Judge. I, I would also argue that um, what it really boils down to is we're still talking about the child's best interests, which is an issue that can't be waived. Um, it, looking at Dr. Shalley's report, he, he balances certain pros and cons, vices and virtues of both parents, and then in the end makes his decision based on this, this improper and unauthorized diagnosis. Oh, go ahead. No, go, isn't that, though, based on what you argue as improper conclusion as opposed to violating father's rights under the court's order. I mean, isn't that really the distinction? Um, well, I, I think that the, the two issues are sort of intertwined. Um, it, it was unauthorized, um, and, th and therefore it was improperly interjected into, into the proceedings. And I understand that, but, uh, but your most recent argument was, look, e even looking at it, it didn't properly assess the child's best interest. So even if you were to look at it on the merits, it still has an issue. Is that right? It? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And so, and just to dovetail on that, um, Dr. Shawley, he improperly used this diagnosis to effectively decide the outcome of the case um, without any reference to, to the allegations of either petition and without any reference to any of the evidence. Um, it's, not, it's not just that he's relying on a diagnosis. The diagnosis is based on father's conduct, presumably. Uh, well, if, that, so is there, does it matter that there's, that there's a label put on it as opposed to if just Dr. Shawley doesn't uh, label him as a narcissistic personality, but just details all of the, what he would view as inappropriate interactions or improper conduct. Why, why does it matter? Would you agree that all of the rest of that would come in even without a, a diagnosis per se of narciss narcissistic uh, personality disorder? I think what you're you're asking me goes to the uh, the basis for for reaching or putting a name on on the diagnosis um, and and looking at the his report from Dr. Shawley, um, you know he, he he bases this diagnosis entirely on uh, well well for starters he, he reached the diagnosis after a single uh, meeting with father that lasted just with father and mother that lasted just three hours so in addition to being unauthorized it also appears to be entirely contrived. But that doesn't, I, I thought he spent at least 16 hours with, with father. It seems like there was a significant amount of time with father and mother. In the end, that's true. But if you look at page three of his report, he lists every single meeting, Dr. Shawley does, every single meeting that he has with everybody that he meets with. And the first entry on that list is from sep uh, September 19th, 2011. It lists a three-hour meeting with mother and father. And then if you look at trial exhibit number 44, it's an email from Dr. Shawley saying, I think this guy has NPD. So although he, in the long run, he did spend a significant amount of time with father, um, this NPD issue comes up almost immediately, suggesting that it's, it's not based. He's a, I don't, he's a skilled and experienced uh, um, psychiatrist. And maybe he had a tentative diagnosis, and then it was borne out over time. I mean, well, I, I think... That, that may very well be true, but that's getting uh, a, uh, you know, a field from um, what we're talking about, and that's the, the propriety or, or the authorization to, to reach the diagnosis uh, in the first place and interject it into, and to basically use it to de decide the case. Um, and, and just to get back to your question, I, I, did that answer the question? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and I'd just like to reiterate that the case really did come down to this diagnosis. Uh, 
Dr. Shali testified that father's personality disorder, I think, trumps the results of any of those allegations, referring to, to both of the petitions. And he also, when asked, did you consider at all any of the events that led up to the petitions, Dr. Dr. Shelley testified, no, I didn't. So regardless of any of the allegations by either of the parties and regardless of any of the evidence, um, this, this, this issue was uh, interjected to decide the case uh, without, without uh, affording father any chance to, uh, to, to address it or rebut. So essentially- uh, Excuse me, I, I, forgive me. Doctor, the doctor issued his report he did have an opportunity to rebut it, didn't he? he? He could have. He did, in fact, obtain an expert to evaluate the, the doctor's report, and he could have obtained his own psychological evaluation. I mean, he, he had plenty of time to do this, didn't he? Um, well, I'm, I, I, I can't uh, answer whether he had plenty of time. Well, uh, I, I don't know about he that. He had an opportunity. Maybe plenty is not a good word here, but he had an opportunity, didn't he? Um, and and I, I don't know because the the report from Dr. Shawley, um you know, makes the diagnosis and then it, it's accepted sort of as uh, a doctrine um, a, after that point. Let me. This is what concerns me. Um, uh, 25403A5 requires the court to consider or to make a finding on the mental and physical health of the individuals involved. So the doctor addressed that factor and made an assessment and tendered a, a diagnosis. What's improper about that when the statute requires the um, court to evaluate the mental health of all individuals involved? Well, Judge, I would point out that in addition to that, imposing that requirement on the courts, the courts must also follow the rules of process to make sure the the, everything happens in a, in a fair way, and it, Rule 63 sets forth that process. And the court's order appointing Dr. Shawley um, sort of dovetails on that that rule, saying it, the language. And I have the order right here. Dr. Shawley may request uh, a psychological assessment. It doesn't say he may do it. it the order also says um, any psychological logical assessment must be performed by a third party. So Dr. Shaw is, is expressly prohibited under the, the rules and the order appointing him to do this all on his own. He, he unilaterally does this on his own, and it, it determines the outcome of the case. But why does it necessarily determine the outcome? If once his report is there, or once he makes an assertion that this is his tentative diagnosis or his, his diagnosis, um, if there's nothing that prevents father from getting another, uh, having another expert evaluate him and provide a, a different, uh, if, if the other expert reaches a different conclusion, why, why is the process somehow um, implicated? Well, it's one thing to reach a tentative diagnosis, and it's another thing to actually say, I diagnosed father with NPD, and this isn't just a uh, mother's expert. This is the- but if we're talking about the process, and father becomes aware that this information is now out there, and isn't process just dictate that he have, uh, a fair process would dictate that he have an opportunity to, uh, to rebut that. Well, um, it does seem like he should have had an opportunity to rebut that, and I, I, uh, I can't speak to, um, you know, what took place at that at that point. Um, but that because that's the secondary question. The first question is whether the custody custody evaluator um, was was allowed to do this in the first place. Um, and so, with that said. Um, I, the custody evaluation needs to be vacated and, and so, so that it can be redone and the parties can have a full and fair opportunity to, to, to go, go forward with psychological assessments if that's what the case is going to really come down to. And um, I'm running out of time. I promised three reasons uh, for reversal. Um, the third goes to calculating child support and father's related obligations. Um, I don't have anything to add to the briefing on this issue, so unless the court has questions, which I'd be happy to talk about, uh, I will rest on the briefs uh, or, or perhaps address it, depending on what uh, mother brings up. Um, and same goes for the attorney's fees issue. Uh, the uh, family court abused its discretion in awarding attorney's fees. Um, and again, I'll rest on the briefs. If I could just go back to the, your, the initial point about the adequacy of the findings and his, uh, the court incorporating essentially uh, pages 40 to 45 of Dr. Shelley's report. I mean, is there something specific on 40 to 40, 
uh, on pages 40 to 45 that, uh, in your view, is not supported by the record? In, in Dr. Shalley's report, right. um, um, I, I could, I'm not sure about that, Judge. Uh, I'm not prepared to, to give a detailed summary uh, of the report. Um, I, I guess but, my question goes to if the, if the court had just taken Dr. Shalley's report and had then just dictated his own order paraphrasing what was on pages 40 to 45 of the report, uh, would there be a reason to to send this case back? Would that would that in your mind be in your view be adequate? Uh, well, no. If if this court if the, this case goes back to the family court and it just the family court cut and paste the findings, we'll be right back here to to address the uh, propriety of the NPD diagnosis. Yeah, but that's a different issue. Just in terms of whether the the findings were adequate by uh, just citing to Dr. Shalley's record. Well, no, uh, I, I'm sorry, I misunderstood the question. Um, the findings are not adequate. Uh, they uh, they list, you know, findings. They're findings, but there, there's no analysis. There's no connection between the findings and the best interests of the child. Um, it's sort of just um, random findings. And did your client request more specific, uh, a specific best interest finding? Absolutely. The, um, I forget. Father submitted uh, a proposed. Uh, a set of proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law, absolutely. And with that, I will we'll take a seat. May it please the court, Taylor Young on behalf of the FLE, Catherine Stevens. Father's arguments for reversal in this case are all procedural. Uh, they don't go to the substance of the issues that were presented below. And father has got new appellate counsel who has been very creative in bringing up and identifying arguments that might possibly have been made at the trial court below, but almost none of which actually were. Uh, so for example, the question about whether or not uh, Dr. Skelly was exceeding the scope of the order, an issue that's not raised in the joint pretrial statement, <coughs> Father Cites to the joint pretrial statement and to this language, which is on page 15, which says, Dr. Skelly inappropriately diagnosed father within the context of the custody evaluation and then relies almost entirely on this diagnosis, I'm while sorry, admittedly say, disregarding data. I say that again? I'm know. sorry. Um, the language from the joint pretrial father's position was that Dr. Skelly inappropriately diagnosed father within the context of the custody evaluation. However, that is not a Rule 63A objection. It's not even an objection that we're going outside of the scope of what's appropriate in a custody evaluation. They called Dr. Stahl, who testified at trial, and Dr. Stahl went through his critiques of Dr. Skelly's report. None of, those rep none of those critiques said you shouldn't be doing a diagnosis. You shouldn't be evaluating father's mental health. So that critique was not raised at all. And if you look at the joint pretrial and the sentences that precede the one that I just read, which father relies on, it says with regard to Dr. Skelly's methodology, he failed to utilize appropriate procedures with regard to his completion of the custody evaluation report. That's a critique that was presented to the trial court about whether Dr. Skelly had done sufficient follow-up and back and forth in terms of his diagnosis. And I'm sorry, my mouth is drying up. I apologize.
it had to do with the substance of the diagnosis and the follow-up and what data was actually used for that process. There's testimony about the length of reports. It's, uh, the, this was a 90-minute trial. 65 minutes of that trial were dedicated to these two experts, I think, something on that order. So uh, this was all presented to the trial court in terms of the substance of the diagnosis. And the trial court says in his order that uh, he thinks that the opinion of Dr. Stahl should be given little weight. And he agrees with the testimony of Dr. Skelly. And he also agrees with the observations made by the parenting coordinator, Stephen Sheldon. And there's a parenting coordinator's report uh, in the record. There's lengthy testimony in the record of father's disruptive behaviors, aggressive behaviors, uh, for example. Counsel, let me, let me ask you. I understand your position on the Rule 63 issue um, and that there was substantial information before the trial judge um, on the record. Let's talk. I would like to hear from you, I should say, um, uh, on the 403 sort of nulled findings requirement. Sure. So uh, the 403 findings requirement, obviously, we've, we've seen the cases that have come down, not only Nold, but and Ray Christopher. And those cases have issued from this court. We believe that, nonetheless, this case is distinguishable. Um, if you look at what happened in this case, we have a judge who heard, not only had a report in front of them, but heard lengthy testimony, had two experts uh, going back and forth, went into the report, specifically identified the pages, made a modification to what had been identified, and set that, and set that language forth saying that, that it had been incorporated. The, what we don't have is a situation we had in Nold, which was the other, concern expressed by, the other concern expressed by the court, which was this inappropriate deference to the expert and the language which we identify in our briefs from that opinion, which says that the court inappropriately took the expert's opinion as this baseline for a custody determination, and I think the language of the case says that found no reason to deviate from the recommendation. And the court, I think rightly in that case, said that that's some, this court said it had some concerns about that uh, because it isn't a baseline that the evaluator's report is where we start and then we, and evidence has to be presented. And so what we really had in that case was instead of findings, or the findings issue is much more an issue of undue deference to the custody evaluator in that case. And I don't think we have that here. We have, again, lengthy testimony. We have counsel on both sides, experienced counsel on both sides, putting, putting the issue before the court, the court engaging. You can read, read the transcripts on the issue and then issuing this ruling. We also have, as this court has recently noted in a footnote, um, in a case involving a nine-day arbitration of a family law case, uh, a very overburdened family law system in Maricopa County. And so, Judge Catani, your question, I think, was telling is, are we suggesting a rule that says that what, we, what we're going to ask family law judges to do now is to go into these custody evaluator reports and cut and paste pages 40 through 45? or dictate and summarize pages 40 to 45. And if we, if we do that, then we've set forth the findings. And I, I would submit that that's a overly, frankly, bureaucratic approach and not necessary to comply with the concerns that are expressed in Nold. Mr. Young, let me share with you what is trouble, trouble, troubling me about the findings or the judge's order here. In light of Reed and then Nold, and this case was decided before this court issued Christopher. So putting, going back in time to the state of the law that existed before then, <coughs> uh, what causes me concern is that the judge did not explain why he agreed or adopted Dr. Scali's, I hope that's the proper pronunciation, recommendations. He, he, 
there seems like there is a, he did not connect the dots, so to speak, as to why he thought this was uh, an appropriate uh, a recommendation he, or a finding that he would adopt. He just didn't explain what persuaded him. And that's, if he had done that, I think this would have been a much more difficult, maybe it would have met the requirements of Reed and Nold and probably even Christopher, but he didn't do that. Well, Your Honor, I think if you look at, again, mm -hmm. Dr. Skelly's report, right. and then you have the testimony that was before the court, um, and you have a critique by Dr. Stahl, and the court saying, I give that very little weight. Um, I don't think that when we go through and look at all of the, the factors that are laid out, we have, in terms of the 403A factors, we have the same concerns that you typically that you have in NOLT in terms of connecting the dots. I really don't think that they're here. And I also want to separate two things out just for the court. We have two modifications going on here, of course. We have a modification of parenting time, and we have a modica modification of legal decision making. And the legal decision making uh, factors, because sole legal decision making is ultimately granted to my client, that implicates not only 403A, but also 403.01, which has the additional factors. And we, we talk about the factors in our brief. And the specific factor, which is the ability of these two parents to co-parent. And what is absolutely clear from the trial court record is that there has been an utter failure of these parents to co-parent. That's why this notion that somehow there isn't an express enough finding of change of circumstances to warrant these modifications when you had cross petitions to modify in a stipulation and then parenting coordinator and experts saying this is an utter failure of co-parenting is I think warrants the um, or sorry doesn't warrant the uh, reversal in this case and you have to also consider that we have Dr. Skelly testifying before the court, he said this child is emotionally disturbed, okay? And there's a, there was a dispute about what, how, where on, uh, on certain spectrums and all of that, as you can imagine. But he says he's definitely emotionally disturbed and he's reactive to conflict. And it's the conflict between these parents that are disrupting his emotional growth, his social growth, his academic growth, and that's why I'm making this recommendation that we get a change in we get a change in the residential uh, the the residential arrangement between these between these parents. And we have so much conflict going on. And Dr. Scully points out that he had a tremendous amount of uh, of interaction with this client. With this client, sorry. Uh, uh, I put my I put myself in the doctor's shoes. Uh, he had a tremendous amount of of interaction with father in this case, and when and he found father to be manipulative. He found father to be domineering. Found father to be inflexible. Found father to be viewing the child as a pawn in the game. These were the things that my client was dealing with all along, which is why you needed this um, you needed this intervention. Let me address, and also I want to mention that uh, Steve Sheldon, the parenting coordinator, also testified that father was domineering and flexible and that mother would have a tremendous, had a tremendous uh, difficulty negotiating with father, which makes it impossible to co-parent when you can't have any kind of negotiation, which is why a change in legal decision making needed to be made. All of that was right there before the court. It's evident in Judge, uh, sorry, it's evident in uh, Dr. Scully's uh, custody evaluation, and there's no basis substantively to disagree with those with those evaluations. So we are going to be in the situation that we saw in, uh, I believe it was Judge Hall who wrote in dissent that what we're going to end up here is if this doesn't comply with NOLD, then we're going to end up back on a remand so that findings can be made 
and then we're going to come back up here to have this fight all over again about perhaps the NPD diagnosis and those sort of things, which just is a tremendous waste of time and judicial resources in service of these best interest findings, which I don't think are uh, problematic when they've been specifically incorporated, specifically referenced, specifically identified. But didn't, isn't that what the court criticized in Reed and really what the court criticized in Nold and they? Well, I think that a fair reading of those cases shows that there is some criticism about reliance on these custody evaluations. Um, and there is, and I think Reed is a little bit distinguishable from distinguishable from Noel too, because in Reed you had more of this complete deference to what the custody evaluator was doing without any reasons being apparent in the record at all. Noel arguably, depending on how you define record, and I know N. Ray Christopher takes a position on record that I don't agree with, but um, that's. It's only my place to say it here to That's preserve okay. it. That's okay. You're entitled to your opinion. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, we don't have the same. Uh, we we that concern I think is pre is is somewhat present for the purposes of appellate review and the purposes of setting the baseline for future modifications. Those have been the identified pur purposes. So obviously you can't read those cases as not having some of this concern. But it is so readily identifiable by reference to the underlying custody evaluator's report, which has been incorporated, that really, what, where are we getting to? Uh, we're, we're getting to a cut and paste world, which I just don't think is what this court should uh, should be looking at. And let's also talk just briefly about the, the waiver issue. Um, I understand that the, the, the general tenant that when you're dealing with best interests, that's it's unwaivable, and that was, it's not unwaivable. The waiver rule is not uniformly applied. And so we have language of recent cases from this court that say you can't, you can't waive your objection to the, uh, to the lack of best interest findings. But we also have other cases <laughs> from this court that say the opposite, including the uh, Benali case, which, uh, points to our Supreme Court case of, uh, I believe it's Toronto, I don't have my, uh, have it right in front of me, but it points to that case and says, you can have waivers. You can have waivers of important issues. Now, obviously the Hayes v. Gamma rationale about best interest, that, that, that's an overriding interest. So I don't want to be cavalier about that, but this issue that we're going to potentially end up back in front of the trial court with for, for findings is something that could have been addressed with the court. It could have been addressed in post-trial motion. If you read Father's post-trial motion, it does not say you failed to make these specific findings. You inappropriately incorporated by reference. What it says is you should adopt our proposed findings. I don't think saying you should adopt our proposed findings is sufficient to alert the court and opposing party that there's a problem that needs to be addressed. I do want to, if the court will indulge me for one second, I would like to go back just very briefly to talk about one of the uh, allegations that was made in father's reply brief since we didn't have an opportunity to to address it in our brief. Um, father, and he argued here today that this NPD diagnosis happened instantly and was a foregone conclusion. And he cites to what was trial exhibit one. Um, trial exhibit one isn't in our appendix, uh, but all of the exhibits apparently came up to the court. I was surprised they hadn't been released back to the parties. So. You have the exhibits, apparently, according to the docket. <laughs> Trial Exhibit 1 is the deposition of Dr. Skelly. And in the lines that Father points to as saying that, as identifying it, yeah, yeah, this was a real problem, uh, that this was this foregone conclusion, we read that the question is, 
In your September 20th email to Dr. Moran to schedule the party's MMPI testing with him, him be, uh, you indicated to him that you were particularly concerned about father, whether he has narcissistic personality disorder, or is his arrogance more culturally embedded? And this was actually discussed, is actually discussed in the custody evaluation report. Um, you felt another, and he, the answer is, Yes, I remember making that statement. Um, you felt that with respect to Dr. Moran, you could make an indication to him that you thought there may be an issue with narcissistic personality disorder. Yes. Later on, on page 97 of that deposition, he says, I'm sorry, it's actually page 96 to 97. The early emails made me, you know, he seemed, the email seemed somewhat arrogant but formal. But it certainly raises, I mean, that arrogance is a symptom of narcissistic personality disorder. So I might as well know, here's a symptom. I don't know if he has a personality disorder, but you need to know what it is. That is not a predetermined he has narcissistic personality disorder. In fact, uh, Dr. Skelly testifies at trial that the cultural issue was one that he was concerned about because father had been raised in Italy and he might have some different cultural thing that hadn't been normed in a way that he could understand. And so when you read, when we go to Dr. Stahl's critique of Dr. Skelly's uh, methodology and conclusion, he doesn't say he reached a foregone conclusion. What he says is that you need to not rely on the diagnosis so much as being a hypothesis. We don't use testing to reach, to reach conclusions. Well, Dr. Skelly didn't. In fact, he testified that the testing wasn't helpful, and it was a hypothesis, and he, was, he tested it over his interactions. So the, the notion that this, the die was cast on this NPD um, diagnosis is just belied by the record. There was plenty of uh, debate about this, and it was uh, considered by the trial court, and the trial court decided to reject Dr. Stahl's uh, opinion and accept Dr. Scully's. Unless the court has any more questions, my time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Whether the family court rejected Dr. Stahl's opinions um, are relevant to the legal issue. The court's the court's findings uh, or lack thereof uh, it, it's, it doesn't come down to a battle of the experts. Um, so the, n nothing um, just said justifies the lack of findings on the record. Um, but if our concern is a failure to connect the dots, and if, if we can connect the dots by looking at the rationale in Dr. Shalley's report and then his, his statement that he doesn't find Dr. Stahl uh, to be um, as credible or, or just isn't persuaded by his opinion. Does that, does that not help us connect the dots? No, because Dr. Stahl wouldn't have, he wouldn't have addressed uh, any of the legal requirements for uh, Dr. Dr. Shawley to go through with this, um, to pull this uh, diagnosis. Um, well, se separating out any kind of impropriety in terms of him uh, choosing to, to make the diagnosis, let's say there'd been a, a formal request for a, uh, a mental evaluation and Dr. Shalley reaches this conclusion. And, and, and now our only question is whether the, the findings are adequate, whether we're left to be connecting dots. Uh, well, it, it sounds to me like you're talking about Dr. Shalley's findings. But the court has referenced those and says I'm essentially adopting those as my own. And. Uh, and I would point back to the Nold case, where the court did the family court did the exact same thing. Uh, the report was in the in a trial exhibit, and the court just the family court just adopted it. Um, and this court said that um, that's not sufficient under the statute. The statute requires uh, the court's own findings on the record. What's your response to the argument by opposing counsel that actually Noel addressed two issues? One that you just described, and the second was the baselining mm -hmm. um, issue, and that therefore distinguishes this case from Noel. Well, the way I read Noel is that was another 
um, just another reason for finding an abuse of discretion. Um, in addition to the lack of findings on the record, uh, it also appeared to the Nold Court that, um, so, so not only did, did the court fail to make its findings on the records, it failed to make any findings. It completely deferred to the expert. It didn't go through any of its own analysis, and neither did it record any of its own analysis. Uh, and so the way I read that case, those are two different issues. You can't defer to an expert, and also you can't just incorporate an expert's findings by reference. Uh, and, and as to the argument that only one of those happened here, what's your response? Um, well, it, it's impossible to tell because there are no findings on the record. Uh, I think that both happened here. Well, but it's, it's a little different perhaps because we have a statement by the judge that, that he rejected one expert and found another expert more either credible or reliable or fill in the blank with some qualitative terms, but then clearly didn't make the, I shouldn't say clearly, apparently didn't make the findings that Nold might otherwise require. Um, well, I'd have to refer back to the order, but I think when, when the, the family court rejected Dr. Stahl, um, he did so, or the court did so, only in reference to the challenge, to, to, the, to the NPD issue, um, which is one aspect of the uh, the best interest analysis uh, in this case. Um, and so I, I don't think that that's, that's evidence that the court went through its own independent analysis uh, of the child's best interest, which, which are several factors. Um, with respect to the waiver issue, um, Although father may not have been as articulate as he could have been, uh, he clearly raised his substantive uh, constitutional rights to uh, the, the care and control of his child. Um, although he may not have re uh, referenced Rule 63 in particular, um, the propriety of of the diagnosis uh, was was clearly raised in the language uh, that I, I just want to read again. Um, suggesting that it, it shouldn't have taken place in the, custody, uh, in the context of a custody evaluation. And what is that language? Dr. Sholley inappropriately diagnosed father within the context of a custody evaluation. Okay. Let me ask you one other question on this point. I believe in your opening um, argument you stated that when the court uh, appointed the evaluator, the court explained, or in the order the court um, directed that if there was going to be a mental health evaluation, it be done by someone else. Are you referring to what is at uh, the record on appeal? I think it's item number 101. That's correct, Judge. And is it paragraph F? Or is there another? Paragraph F. OK. Well, I'll have to think about that. I don't read that paragraph as saying that. What it says is the evaluator may request that the parties and the children participate in adjunct services to be provided by third parties. I, I, I tentatively see a distinction between the evaluator determining that perhaps individuals may well be um, benefited by services and encourage them to get adjunct services versus what this man was doing, which was making an evaluation. I'm, so I'm not sure I read it that way, but I'll have to think, I'll have to look at it in the overall context. There's nothing else you're referring to. That's it, though. That, that's that's uh, okay. what I'm referring to, Judge. Okay. Um, uh, if I may just point out one last thing uh, in, in rebuttal. The mother paints a very dire picture um, with respect to how the, the report portrays father. And the report says some very, very nice things about father, too. He provided for all of the, I'll just pull the, the language here. Um, father and the child have a good, loving relationship. The child attaches to and enjoys his time with father. Who take, the father takes great interest in the child's welfare, um, provides a network of support and warm relationships in the community, provides for all the child's basic needs. Father spends m much time with the child, joining him in activities and tutoring him and is focused on the child overcoming any academic disabilities he has. So it's just not fair to say that uh, the report is completely one-sided in, in that regard. Um, Unless there are any questions, I'm done. Thank you. thank you very much. I'd like to thank both counsel for their argument and their briefing today. Um, we'll take this matter under, advise, under advisement and issue a decision in due course. Thank you.